I would like to officially welcome you to the University of Texas at Dallas. On behalf of the University of Texas at Dallas Asia Center, I'd like to welcome you to our beautiful campus. Um, there's much change occurring here. If you, uh, you, some of you are students here. You can know you, we're building a brand new biomedical building. We have a brand new arts and technology building. Um, in addition to that, approximately two years ago, we established the UT Dallas Asia Center. Um, our center is focused on increasing understanding of, as well as connection to Asia. So this evening's program is a great example of how we as a university can partner with a community group to bring a, a conversation on critical issues that are affecting Asia, and in this case, specifically South Asia. Um, I want to take this time right now to thank South Asia Democracy Watch. It would not have been possible without you to, to bring such a sweet panelist to our, our community. So thank you for, for doing that. And we owe a lot to you, and I'm glad that I now have a new community partner as well as plenty of friends, which is the best what counts in life anyway. So at this time, I would like to invite Amir Makani. Um, I want to quickly introduce him before I ask him to come here. He is a, an accomplished individual. Like me. My words won't uh, do justice to what you've accomplished in your life, but he's been a longtime business and community leader in Dallas as well as Fort Worth area. He owns, he owns a real estate business, and he's moved um, to the U.S. from England 32 years ago after completing his higher education. He's been working with several businesses as well as community organizations as a social, as a social worker, CEO, and real estate developer. Amir Khan has been serving um, with, with the Greater Dallas Asian Chamber of Commerce as a member of his advisory board. He's also um, served as a director of the Pakistan Society of North Texas as well as the um, director of Nazari Federal Credit Union. He is a critical part of the Board of Directors for the South Asia Democracy Watch and a vital force in establishing connections with business organizations as well as spearheading this fundraising campaign. I'm glad to say that he's not, not only a, a great community partner, but truly, I'm claiming you as my friend from here. Please, please. I have to hold this mic, right? Yeah, I can give you this. No, it's good. Is that good? Uh -huh. uh, first of all, uh, we are a little uh, late. I'm sorry about that, but uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And um, distinguished uh, guest, and Monique. Now she's called friend, so I don't have to call her with the last name. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, as she told you, that my name is Amir Makani. And I'm a president of South Asia Democracy Watch Executive Committee. I would like to thank all of you for coming to participate in the most important discussion of our, our time in South Asia. South Asia, which housed two nuclear nations, where poverty, hunger, and extremism threatening the shores of Africa, freedom, cohesion of our, our society, the same freedom for which people of region independently and collectively achieved from colonial masters with generational struggle. South Asia is a crossroad. One part takes us to peace and the other one leads us to confrontation. Confrontation which benefits no one. No one, I said. And there is a destruction everywhere. An economic and political question which always takes the headline is whether the nation can achieve peace without justice. I would like to reserve this sequence of the question as how justice can be achieved without peace. Justice can be justice be a two different shades depending on parties of conflict, but peace is a universal. Peace provides the environment for dialogues and for resolution of issues such peace is a goal, not just a strategy. There is a good probability that a peaceful society will be justice and democratic society. I leave the analysis on conflict and social economy and sociological burden people are facing because of this conflict on this uh, distribution panel. However, I would like to thank our partner in our endeavor, the South Asia Center, UT Dallas, and especially Monique for our support and guidance for our group. Thank you, Monique, one more time. 
Now I would like to thank our scholar, activist and peacemaker in our panel, Ms. Bina Sarwar. She has came all the way from Boston. Thank you, Bina, for coming in. Thank you. And Dr. Naila Khan, who come from Oklahoma. She just came for this uh, event only, for only three hours. So I really appreciate Naila. She has a flight to catch, and we are sorry, Naila, we are a little late. Thank you, Naila. And Mr. Shari, Sunny Sharma from Houston, he's our neighbor. He, uh, he came from Houston, and he was very generous that he uh, came without any notice. And we, when we say that Bina Server, Naila Khan, and Pitbull Paul in his foreign game, Pakistan, he says, yeah, I will come. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite uh, our fourth panelist, is, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Preepal Singh. Uh, Preepal is a, a board member as well as a physician. And uh, he has a very busy schedule, but he always there for South Asia. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Thank you very much. And now I would like to thank our associate and board member of South Asia. First of all, we have Raja Khanzad, Director of Media Coordinator. I think unfortunately he's stuck in a traffic somewhere. But we will introduce at the end. And now I will call Raja Muzaffar. Raja Muzaffar is the person who is the authority on Kashmir. Raja Sahib, can you come up front, please? Can you come up front? And Aftab Siddiqui, our board of director. Uh, Aftab is a chairman of a Muslim community center, peace center. He is a in a lot of association and his great hard working individual. I'm sorry. Is it working? Is it working? Yes. And now we have a uh, we have Akbar Birani, our new member. Akbar is a uh, is an entrepreneur and he uh, is part of silver clubs and everything and he joined our association and thank you Akbar come on in. And we have one more uh, big personality. She should be in a panelist, but we will uh, invite her for next time. Dr. Mona Kazmusha. She's well known as a radio talk show host, journalist, physician by training. She also associates a financial uh, political show. Mona has written a lot of articles in Huffington Post and Daily Beats and etc. And now I'd like to call Asif Afendi. Asif Afendi is a director and well-respected community activist. Uh, Asif is uh, run um, a group, a Christian foundation, which help uh, individual to give them a training and everything if uh, for the job replacement and everything. Asif, uh, he started his Christian foundation and he's devoted himself and if somebody need help, he's there for technical, he runs the IT, he works for, I think, uh, IBM and a lot of other is a security guy, <laughs> and uh, we have Dr. Pripal. He's sitting in a panelist. Dr. Saab is a community leader with Gala Sikh community. He's a physician by profession and a contributor of a lot of blogs and newspaper. Dr. Saab, thank you. And Siraj, but I think he's absent too. And now Dr. Kesar Abbas. He uh, he is the founder member. But he has a job in um, a university in Virginia, so he's not here. And for the last, we will keep it, uh, Mr. Fayaz. Mr. Fayaz is a Secretary General of South Asia Democracy Watch. He is the first South Asian from North Texas to be a national delegate to any political party. Sayyad, uh, Fayaz is a co-chairman of American Muslim Caucuses and founding member of South Asia. I think I will be mistaken if I'm not saying that it, it is his uh, effort and his hard work and everything that make this event possible. He is working, I think, 24 hours a day just to get this event done. He is running around and he's, he's, he's running around like a crazy, you know. And he's a, Don't say that I have freedom from my job. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, um, thank you for your yes, advice. Without you, it's not possible. Thank you. And Monique, once again, thank you very much. Uh, 
I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Tosibai. <laughs> I, I was, uh, I'm really sorry. Tosibai is our um, uh, legal department. <laughs> He's a attorney by profession and he he is a very heavily involved in a lot of institutes and everything. He is in a peace center and he is, uh, started already one more NGO uh, uh, with the legal right. And he he's involved in Muslim Democrat caucuses. He's actively involved in uh, uh, politics and he's very very uh, well known community figure. Sorry about that, Joseph, no. but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, dialogue. Testing, testing. In a recent dialogue, Philip Oldenburg, who's a director and associate director of Southern Asian Institute at Columbia University, and Dr. Saeed Shafka, founder and chairman of the Department of Pakistan Studies at Kaidi Azam University in Islamabad, described South Asia as a region of great opportunity and progress but also a place that has historically suffered from territorial conflicts that are rooted in religious, cultural, and ethnic division. This panel this evening will discuss the nature of this conflict in South Asia. And then we're going to take the time to examine specific movements that are occurring within the region as well as um, externally from the regions that are focused on promoting peace. I know for sure tonight we're going to be rewarded with the, um, just a quality of panelists. Um, it is an accomplished group, so thank you for being here today. Um, I want to give you a plan for our evening. I was going to introduce you, but I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. The introductions and their full bios are in your program. So just know, trust me, they're accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> and then what we're going to do is each of the panelists will present for about 20, 50 to 20 minutes. Then we'll open the session for question and answers. Um, there's one thing that I want to say. I know that any discussion of conflict is, is an emotional topic, you know, when we talk about it. I know it's specifically, having grown up in Pakistan, in Islamabad specifically, how emotional this topic can be. So I just ask you to please remember that you're on record. Okay, we are videotaping you. And then um, when you have a question, please stand up and identify yourself and be as concise as possible with your question. Okay, so I'd like at this point to transition over to Dr. Naila Khan. Thank you again for being here. Yes, you can speak from there. Where are we? Thanks. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Yes. It's good to be here, and I would like to thank UT Dallas Asia Center as well as South Asia Democracy Watch for having organized this event. So I'm from the state of Jammu Kashmir, which is uh, cradled by the Himalayas in the south and by the Karakoram range of the Pamirs in the north. Subsequent to the declaration of the ceasefire between India and Pakistan on January 1st, 1949, the state of Jammu and Kashmir was divided into two portions. The part that I'm from was politically assimilated into India. A small portion of the state was integrated into Pakistan. And China annexed a part of the state in 1962, through which it has built a highway from Tibet to Xinjiang. So I will speak on hope for peace in South Asia from the perspective of a Kashmiri. The state of Jammu and Kashmir, by the way, borders China and Afghanistan, in addition to India and Pakistan, of course. So the state of Jammu and Kashmir is so geographically located that it depends for its economic growth on an unhindered flow of trade to both India and Pakistan. Kashmiri arts and crafts have found flourishing markets in India for decades. At the same time, the rivers and roads of Kashmir stretch into Pakistan. Prior to 1947, Rawalpindi, which is now in Pakistan, used to be Kashmir's railhead. And Kashmiri traders would use Karachi, also now in Pakistan, as the seaport for overseas trade. The welfare 
of the people of Jammu and Kashmir can be guaranteed by securing the goodwill of the political establishments of both India and Pakistan, and by the display of military discipline and efficiency at the borders. The forte of the armed forces of a country, to the best of my knowledge, is national security, not national interest or foreign policy. If the political evolution of a society is nipped in the bud by a belligerent military establishment, state policies always fall short of becoming coherent. The more the military establishment makes incursions into democratic spaces, the more shaky institutions of state remain, and the more fragmented the polity becomes. Once a populace begins to question the validity of the choices it exercises in the electoral process, because processes of electioneering and institutions of democratic governance lack transparency, the socio-political fabric is ripped to pieces. The sovereign role played by the general headquarters of the military in Pakistan <laughs> is an example of such a scenario. In civilized societies, political dissent is not curbed, and national integrity is not maintained by military interventions. The more military officials get involved in issues of politics, governance, and national interests, the more blurred the line between national interests and hawkish national security becomes. Contrary to what the Indian military establishment is doing in Jammu and Kashmir and the Northeast, and what the Pakistani military establishment is doing in Balochistan, people must learn to work together across ethnic and ideological divides and insist that everyone be included in democratic decision making and be given access, full access, to basic social services. It is an egregious mistake, and one that has severe ramifications, to allow the military of a nation-state to bludgeon its democratic processes. Instead of deterring the growth of democracy, the goal should be to empower the populace of both India and Pakistan sufficiently to induce satisfaction with their role within current geopolitical realities such that a disempowered populace does not succumb to ministrations of destructive political ideologies. In addition to addressing the political aspect of democracy, it is important to take cognizance of its economic aspect as well. A strong and prosperous India is a guarantee to peace in our region, but a strong and prosperous Pakistan would strengthen that guarantee. So gloating over the instability in either one of these countries serves no purpose and proves detrimental to peace in our region. The goal should be to find a practical solution to the deadlock that would enable preservation of peace in the Indian subcontinent while maintaining the honor of everyone concerned. The translation of a political and social vision into reality requires an efficacious administrative setup and vibrant educational institutions which produce dynamic citizens while remaining aware of the exigencies of the present. A political movement that pays insufficient welfare, that, I'm sorry, that pays insufficient attention to the welfare of the populace good governance and rebuilding democratic institutions ends up leaving irreparable damage in its wake. An insurgency or militant nationalist movement that lacks such a vision is bound to falter. The electoral process and establishment of a government are not ultimate goals or ends in themselves, but are means to nation building and societal reconstruction. Even religious and political rhetoric 
remained simply rhetorical without a stable and representative government. We cannot underestimate the importance of standing up and being counted. Saber rattling by the representatives of India and Pakistan is futile, and there will be no headway until the process of political negotiations and accommodation begins. The prevalent uncertainty in South Asia helps in the institutionalization of corruption, and opportunists make hay while the unpredictability remains unresolved. Obviously, an important challenge then and now is the restoration and sustenance of democratic processes in both India and Pakistan. The validation of a secularism that recognizes diverse religious identities and allows for the accommodation of those identities within a secularist framework. Creating new openings for people, including the young, to discuss public issues and become active participants. The aim of that process should be repair of the frayed ethnic fabric in all parts of the Indian subcontinent. In a democratic setup, however flawed it might be, the will and aspirations of the electorate are ignored by politicians at their own peril. The youth in India and Pakistan clamor for democratic rights, efficient governance, a stable infrastructure, and a much less fractious polity, um, which would restore pluralism in South Asia. The electoral principle is discussion, not autocratic decisions. It is essential to create either conceptual frameworks or political and sociocultural discourses in which the young people of today would be energized and persuaded to actively participate. It is imperative that civil society actors work in collaboration with one another to focus on the rebuilding of a greatly polarized and fragmented social fabric, to ensure the redress of inadequate political participation insistence on accountability for human rights violations through transitional justice mechanisms, reconstruction of the infrastructure of the productive capacities of both India and Pakistan, and resumption of access to basic social services. How can we, as a people, develop the ability to organize <clears throat> and mobilize for social change which requires the creation of awareness, not just at the individual level, but at the collective level as well. We require a quality education for these mammoth tasks. This is where we need to bridge the divide between the civil society of India and that of Pakistan in order to pave the way for the education of the younger generation. Civil society and political institutions are closely interconnected. In order to create democracy, there must be a minimum of participation and an adequate pluralism in a society. A consolidated democracy has to be open to diverse opinions, dissent, and differences of opinion on policies is an important element of every democracy. There must, however, be some shared consent on fundamental principles. Democratic, social, and educational institutions cannot function in a country without participation <clears throat> by citizens. The identity of a state or a nation cannot be built on unquenchable hate and certainly not on cashing in on the pain and grief of other people. It is, or at least, should be inconceivable in the day and age of a global economy to spurn the concepts of reason, rationality, and political and moral ethics. <clears throat> the perpetuation of a politics that emphasizes, reinforces, or creates cultural myopia and monocultural identities in societies as diverse as those of South Asia would be the bane of our existence. 
This damaging short-sightedness results in intolerance, arbitrary justice, tyranny, and <clears throat> ignorance. Dissatisfaction with the policies of the governments of India and Pakistan should not encourage the glorification of reactionary politics. The last thing that South Asia needs is Taliban ideologues in any guise, either <clears throat> civil or political or military. Such an extremist ideology, or even a mild form of it, confuses local, national, and international observers, and ends up encouraging reductive interpretations of the politics of India and Pakistan. Despite the several letdowns, we need to remember that the process of democratization is an evolutionary one, and does not provide instant solutions. To further this process, it is just as important to maintain the pluralistic, <coughs> regional, religious, cultural, and linguistic ethos of both India and Pakistan. The truth is that it is time to summon up the courage to initiate a politics <coughs> of construction. Can we begin the process of developing a cohesive society with coherent state policies? A fragmented society cannot accomplish anything, either politically or socioeconomically. As Abraham Lincoln said in 1858, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Not just in the state that I come from, Jammu and Kashmir, but in many parts of the world, women can play an important role in establishing a more inclusive democracy and new forums for citizen cooperation. Female leaders can lead the way by offering new ideas, building broad-based political coalitions, and working to build organizational divides. Identifying areas of common outlook and interest is a process of growth. I firmly believe that in order to address wider political, socioeconomic, and democratic issues in the Indian subcontinent, we need to rethink the relationship between state and non-state actors, between state and society, <coughs> and therefore between the structures of decision-making in these two arenas. The state cannot be wished away. It will not disappear off the face of this earth. Mainstream political parties cannot be wished away either. So we need to reconceptualize and rethink the relationship between state and non-state actors. And we can talk more about this during the Q&A. Perhaps it is time to seriously consider a new regional order which would be capable of producing cross-economic, political, and cultural interests among the people of the region. Women in civic associations and in government can lead the way toward a peaceful, pluralistic democracy and support international negotiations for a sustainable <coughs> peace in the region. So with that thought, thank you very much. Thank you for having given me Thank you for having given me this hearing. Uh, I, hope we, I hope we get to discuss the points that I made during the today. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, why don't we go ahead and transition to you, Bina? And then I know that you have a video as well that you would like to show, so we have that loaded. The document. Yeah, actually, it's. Um, Is it? Yeah, I've lined up already. Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, this is a, a documentary that I made in 2009. And it uh, is about actually Kashmir and about um, the need to let people meet on both sides. Um, and uh, like I said, it's made, I made this in 2009, and it's called Let Them Meet, Milne Do. So it's about seven minutes long. So Yeah. And I'm sorry, can I just, um, uh, just, just the, the, the music in it and the, um, uh, the, the, the vocals in it are by Seema Anil Sagal, which many of you might know. She's a singer based in Mumbai, and she's known as uh, Bulbulay Kashmir. Yeah, she's yeah. from Jammu. Yeah. And uh, her husband, when I was making this documentary, 
you know, this is how uh, borders get sort of irrelevant. And I um, was on chat with him, and I said, I need, it, I need music for this documentary. And you know, within minutes, I had this audio file, and I put it in there, and it's yeah. ah, so. So, can they be? कश्मीर का मसला पाकिस्तान और भारत के दरमियान 1947 से इख्तलाफ की जड़ रहा है। कश्मीरियों की अक्सरियत पाकिस्तान और भारत दोनों को मुस्तरद करती है। कुछ पाकिस्तानियों को बजाओड एजेंसी से आने वाले इस मेहनत कश की तरह कश्मीर में अपनी सूरतेहाल का अक्स नजर आता है। उधर भी है तो कश्मीर के तरह दर्श रहे आप लोगों के लिए आपका अपने आप निर्माण चाहिए ताज़े माँ का भी चाहिए। मज़ाहिया फनकार साध हारून ने इस मसले को अपने तंत्र का निशाना बनाया। in an age of F-16s and freedom fighters, at the height of a Cold War bosom, a heart of love, the movie of the century, Pipeline of Passion. Starring Clark Gable as President Pervez Musharraf. Frankly, my dear, I'm going to build a dam. <laughs> also starring Preeti Zinda as Sonia Gandhi. Come on, girls, let's go to the party. The Congress party. <laughs> Yes, Sonia. <laughs> you take Kashmir. No, you take Kashmir. In school, we used to learn that Kashmir is Pakistan. Indians have been in the same And then you find out later on that it's a bit more complex. Unki apni soch mein gehrai, us vaqt aai, jab Kashmiri musannif Basharat Peer se ek dost ki ghar New York mein mulaqat hui. Stay in touch. He asked to come and stay with me. Facebook ka kya baal hai? Ki it's really technology has really changed the world. He said that ha, mujhe, I, mujhe bahut shock hai Pakistan aane ka. Really excited to have Mushaharat be with us today to comment about Pakistan. It was very interesting. That to you, Pakistan is a landmark. What I meant to say was it was an abstraction of a collage of images. Karachi is a city like which has so many multiple worlds in it. One. Really had no, no real sense of Pakistan. Kashmir ke beech ahi ni parda, logon ko milne se rokta hai. 2004 mein BBC Urdu London ke Mazhar Zaidi ne taksim shuda khandano ko internet ke zare milwaya. Kashmir mein to literally gaon ke beech mein lakhir laga di gayi hai, theek hai? तो वो एक भाई उधर है एक भाई उधर है तो हमने ऐसे ज़्यादातर फैमिली में जो 25 साल तक आपस में बहन भाई की नीचे जो फैमिली मेंबर्स हैं वो नहीं मिले। So the perception here in Pakistan और पाकिस्तान साइड ऑफ़ कश्मीर was that as if the other side of कश्मीर is really backward and you know there is no education system. Well, I mean there is a lot of oppression, but in terms of development and all of that, it turned out when they the people came and talked, they were much more educated. Lahore ki Munize Jahangir un abalin 16 sahafiyon mein thi, jinko October 2004 mein Bharat ki zare atmam Kashmir jaane ka mauka mila. जो यहाँ पे perception बना हुआ है पाकिस्तान के अंदर कश्मीर के बारे में वो बड़ा मुख्तलिफ था जो actually वहाँ पे ground realities थी पहले तो जब हम कश्मीर की बात करते हैं तो हम शायद सिर्फ वैली की बात करते हैं मगर उधर जाके जम्मू भी है उधर वैली भी है उधर और भी कुछ areas हैं और उन different areas में लोग different चीजें चाहते हैं और उनकी मुख्तलिफ demands हैं तो वो जो चीज है कि वो फैक्टर इन नहीं की गई पाकिस्तान में पाकिस्तान के अंदर कभी जो हिंदू पंडित्स हैं उनकी कभी बात नहीं हुई कश्मीर में अक्सरियत मुसलमान हैं और वहाँ हिंदू पंडित एक अक्लियत हैं जिन में से तीन लाख से ज्यादा हमले के बाद या डर के मारे अपने घर छोड़ने पर मजबूर हुए हैं there were more. There was no absolute truth, really. But there were so many stories there. There, there were different points of view. There were different feelings, etc. You know, I mean, there were there was 
anger against the security forces, there was anger against the militants. I think one had become so immune to, to the whole Kashmir this thing, it was like a propaganda war between India and Pakistan, you know. I felt that Kashmir was not, not uh, just something, a, a piece of property between India and Pakistan, but I, I felt that it was about, about people. And I remember Mariana broke down and she met this woman. Her husband had become a militant. And she had been, you know, she, she picked up her feet and showed her gash. The stomach, you know, she had been stabbed. It was really traumatic, I think. A lot of the times we just broke down in tears. जनवरी 2008 और 9 में कठमंडू में कॉन्फ्लिक्ट रिपोर्टिंग वर्कशॉप्स में एक दूसरे से मिले। इन वर्कशॉप्स का इत्तेमाम पैन ऑफ साउथ एशिया ने किया। वर्कशॉप के दौरान एहसास ये हुआ कि इनको दूसरी तरफ का ज़्यादा इल्म नहीं है। एक दूसरे से मिलके इतनी उनको खुशी थी और और मिलते ही ये एहसास था कि बस छह दिन में हम बिछा जाएंगे और फिर शायद नहीं मिल पाएंगे। इतना उन्होंने वक्त वर्कशॉप में भी गुजारा और उसके बाद भी जो वक्त था उसमें भी सारी महिलाएं दो-दो तीन तीन बिल्डर अगले दिन पता चलता था कि सबकी आंखें लाल हैं क्योंकि रात तक रात जगा था और गाने गाए जा रहे थे दो तीन कश्मीरी पाकिस्तानी कश्मीरी थे तो वो एयरपोर्ट तक गए उनको छोड़ने और ये हमने कभी पहले जर्नलिस्ट वर्कशॉप में देखा इंडिया पाकिस्तान की भी कई वर्कशॉप्स नहीं लेकिन उसमें ये नहीं था रोना धोना था बाहर I mean, so we couldn't go. So I felt lucky that you know a little part of Kashmir came to us. ये बात तो अब तस्लीम शुदा है कि कश्मीर के मुस्तकबिर पर मुजाकरात में कश्मीरियों की शमूलियत जरूरी है। साथ ये भी लाजम है कि लोगों के आपस में राते कायम रहें और ये चंद मुलाकातों तक ही महदूद ना रहें। Sorry, we got stuck in traffic coming and that's why we weren't able to be here ahead of time to organize this. It took us like an hour to, to get here. But um, thank you for, for watching the film. And like I said, I made this in uh, 2009. And um, I think it's like been five years now, but I think it's still relevant. And I, it's a really short film. And um, I don't know if I was able to capture the complexity of, of the thing and how of, uh, uh, the, the, the how how shiddat ko kya kehte hain ki shiddat se log milna chahte hain dusre se with so much uh, the people are so keen to meet the, across the divide and there is so much love across the divide for both sides and um, just just today uh, on, on the way on in, in the airplane i was editing an article um, oh, oh that's right yeah and everybody went up please um, so I was editing an article by a young Indian researcher who had come to Pakistan and he um, just recently. And you know, there's firing going on at the line of Kashmir right now, and there's been uh, the, talk, the dialogue has been called off since um, you know uh, in, in August that was supposed to have taken place. And so on the on the side of the uh, of the governments, there's been so much uh, hostility in keeping people away, and it's so difficult. I'm invited to a conference in Pune uh, in December, and I don't know if I'll get the visa. It's so difficult. And that, that's what makes it really hard. So, but I don't want to talk about conflict so much here, although I guess my 
would I, yeah. So uh, this, I, these are these people already know. We've had the, the, the wars. We've had, we've got the nuclear shadow. We've got, you know, we, we, we keep uh, restricting our borders, but security within our countries remains a problem. And the cost of poverty, I mean, everybody knows. This is a picture I took in Bombay of a little boy selling flags at Independence Day in Kashmir. And in Pakistan, you have the same thing. You have children on the streets selling flags at Independence Day, and they're smiling, and they want to sell you their flags, and they shouldn't be on the streets in the first place. Um, the cost of conflict, I'm not going to go through these figures. I think everybody knows uh, roughly the bottom line is that uh, we spend too much money on defense and armaments and not enough on people. We have we've had Kargil, we've had Siachin, um, we've uh, had casualties. 50% of the soldiers who make it back alive from Siachin uh, suffer from permanent injuries, mental or physical. And more people, are, more soldiers are killed in Siachin uh, through frostbite than with enemy bullets. Um, and there, there have been um, uh, proposals to convert Siachin into a peace park. And I really take uh, Dr. Nala Khan's point that she made earlier about um, you know, uh, re rethinking the whole uh, way that, that we do politics in our, in our area. Um, and I think that we really need to propose a South Asian union. And we need to you know, try and work towards that. Um, so it's essential for peace with India and Pakistan. Peace with India, Pakistan is essential for, for India uh, because of the huge bilateral benefits um, and res not, not resolving Kashmir damages India's credibility. Having hostile in, uh, relations with Pakistan damages India's credibility. And you know, right now, India is on this, you know, ascendant part. They sent, you know, uh, sign, uh, you know, scientists to, to Mars and uh, a, a, a missile to Mars or whatever. Um, and on, on the other side in Pakistan, you know, we really need to develop democracy and we really need to develop relations with India in order to develop our democracy. And economically, it's essential. Um, and also, I would like to just throw out here that the term jihadi, which means holy warrior, instead of that, we should use the word fasadi. And anybody who knows Indian, uh, Hindi or Urdu knows that fasad means dissent, and the fasadis are those who create dissent and divisions. And so we, calling them jihadis gives them a kind of a, a legitimacy, which I don't think they deserve. Calling it a jihad gives them a legitimacy, which I don't think is uh, warranted. So I don't think we should use the terms that um, give them any kind of legitimacy. And, and I think Pakistan needs to move its, change its policy. And I think there's a consensus in Pakistan that we need to change this policy uh, to make it pro-peace and anti-fasadi rather than pro-fasadi and anti-India. And we really need to move towards that. So with this background, Aman Kiyasha, um, and as um, Monique mentioned, I'm uh, the editor for the Pakistan side with the Fadijam group. Uh, Oman Kiyashi was la launched on January 1st, 2010. It was supposed to be launched in, uh, a year earlier, but then that Bombay uh, thing had happened. And this was a front page ad, that it's a wraparound ad that Times of India produced at that time, uh, that friends are different, enemies are the same, really nice text. And also, I don't have a picture of that, but there was an unprecedented front page ad in the Jung, in the news, and in the Times of India, which was identical. And I don't think this has happened anywhere in the world that two countries which have had, which have a history of conflict, have had a joint editorial uh, published on the front page of newspapers on either side of different papers. Uh, this is another front page ad that was uh, Love Pakistan, which was front page. It was on billboards in major cities. Um, Gulzar, the well-known uh, poet, uh, I don't know many of you might have heard his uh, po poem, um, the eyes don't need visas, dreams have no frontiers, uh, Rose Millet Chala Jata Hoon, Mehdi Hassan Se, you know, in his dream he goes to visit Mehdi Hassan on the other side, now the late Mehdi Hassan, and Amitabh Bachar was part of that campaign. I'm just sort of showing you how this campaign really, the launch five years ago of this campaign, uh, four years ago, um, in 2010, and there's the anthem, I don't know if we can play it, it's actually really nice, I think we can. Oh, no, sorry, we can't. <laughs> There's some third party infringement, whatever. But anyway, if you go to the YouTube and you search for Aman Kiyasha Anthem, you'll see there's an anthem sung by, uh, by uh, Rahat Patel and Shankar Mahadevan. And it's uh, a really, really uh, inspiring and uplifting song. Um, and then there's this, uh, there's a criticism that the Jung group at the Times of India 
uh, very um, our, our, our media groups that are uh, have a hostile policy towards the other country. And you know, perhaps they do. And when I took on this uh, assignment, some of my friends said, "Why are you joining the Jung group, which has a hostile policy towards India, and you know, doing this?" And I said, "You know, if I'm get, given a foothold somewhere, a platform in a mainstream uh, organization, I'll take it because um, you know, it, it gives me a chance to spread that message. And I'm a journalist, but this is a cause I believe in, so I'd like to use my um, journalism for this." This cause that I've been involved with for uh, since 1993, 93 or 94, when the Pakistan India People's Forum for Peace and Democracy was made, and so the the, the, the editorial policies, whatever they might be of both sides, at least they've given a space for a monkey asha and given it uh, some uh, uh, space, um, and 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 uh, uh, polls that were conducted um, on both sides of the border a year after the launch of a monkey asha showed that perceptions about the other country were significantly less hostile than, it, than they were a year earlier. Oh, yeah, sorry, it's a um, This is just some of the pages that were published at that time, um, you know, showing the poll results and um, what people were saying. Um, these are just some of the pages we published at that time. Um, and people overwhelmingly felt uh, uh, that people-to-people -people contact is really, really essential. Aman Kiyasha has held, I mean, people say, what do you do? There's not very much going on, but there maybe there isn't, but there are, you know, it's like bits and pieces, we just keep doing things. There have been closed door discussions on critical issues like Kashmir, security concerns, intelligence sharing, water, media, very contentious issues uh, that Aman Kiyasha has held dialogues, closed door dialogues um, on, um, that, that there have then been, you know, the findings have been made public, there have been, um, the people have come, the, the participants have come in front of public gatherings and asked, have attended Q&A sessions and uh, taken the issues forward with that. Um, this was, these are pictures from a uh, seminar called the Common Destiny uh, Strategic Seminar in Lahore, um, at which, um, at which Kasuri Sao, who's in the middle in that top slide, uh, the former foreign minister, at which he revealed that during the Musharraf time, Kashmir had nearly, they had nearly resolved the issue. And I think I really appreciate Dr. Mala Khan's point that uh, without the democratic political process and the democratic legitimacy, Musharraf could not, Musharraf could not take his um, so-called settlement on Kashmir forward because he was not a legitimately elected leader and was not going to work you know, pan out in the long run. So those points have to be taken forward by elected representatives and not by military dictators. Um, and they've been continued to have, under Aman Kiyasha, they've, they've, you know, like strings and Abda Parveen and um, Mushairas and literary events have taken place and um, uh, has, has continued that throughout these, this time we've been having these uh, things. And we had this amazing peace hankies campaign um, in which children from both sides um, wrote peace messages on um, handkerchiefs, which we then exchanged in a, what we call a tug of peace at Baba border. And um, this this banner was part of that campaign, the children in Aftabad before Bin Laden was found. <coughs> um, the children in a private school in Aftabad made this huge banner. They said, we're not just going to do little hankies. They did this huge banner, and this shows the banner crossing the line at Baba border, and I had my foot on, on the line. I mean, one side of it is us and the other side is the Indians and the, and the soldiers were like, hey, madam, madam, you have to get your foot back from that line, you know, that white line. It was a little bit funny. Um, so that, so the, they, they had this exchange and in fact, uh, yesterday I got an, a message at the, on the Monkey Asha Facebook page from a, a young girl who is now 15 and she says, I participated in the Peace Hand Peace campaign of, you know, four years ago and I want to take this further. I'm 15 years old now and I have a friend in India and we want to do a peace project with India and Pakistan. So, you know, the, these things have made an impact and it's just, you can't tell immediately what impact it has made, but these kind of things keep coming up. This was also at the Tug of Peace where we had this big musical event. Um, the singer is, uh, his name is Jesse Singh Lalpuria. He's from Faisalabad, which used to be called Lalpur, Lalpur. So he's Jesse Singh Lalpuria. What I didn't like about his performance was that he felt the need to um, sort, of, sort of say that I'm Pakistani and you Indians, and you know, on the other side, he was sort of like taunting the Indians on the other side, so it kind of, I think, uh, tainted the event 
a, a little bit, but it was still a good event. Um, and of course, the economic benefits of peace, uh, we've been talking about that, how it costs India and Pakistan so much more to transfer goods, mostly via Dubai. And with that in mind, Aman Kiyasha also launched um, a business meet, and this was from the first meeting in Delhi uh, in 2010, and that is Bridge Mohan Munjal of Hero Honda, and he told us how he set, helped to set up a factory in his, uh, in, in fact, Lalpur, Faisalabad, where he was from, and he told us how he had been helping people across the border, you know, quietly on his own. Um, and he spoke, and he, you know, had amazing poetry, and he spoke in beautiful Urdu, and it was just such a pleasure to listen to him. Um, and this is uh, the then finance minister, Pranam Mukherjee, uh, and he greeted, he said, uh, I'd like to thank Shah Rukh Khan, and it's actually Shah Rukh Hassan of Jammu uh, Jammu Group. So he said, he kept saying Shah Rukh Khan, and he's like, why are people laughing? And it was because it was uh, Shah Rukh Hassan of uh, the Jam group that he wanted to thank. Um, so the, the six, there were six sectors identified at that meeting which have been taken forward, but very, very, um, not with as much force as they could have been. The six sectors, health, education, skills training, information technology, energy, agriculture, and textiles, uh, that the, the business people of these sectors want to cooperate with each other. They want to not just um, work with each other, they want to invest in each other's countries and, uh, you know, actually invest in each other's countries and that was the most uh, significant thing I think that came out of that and it's been going forward, I mean, as you've seen, as you followed, that they've been talking about the state banks uh, opening branch, the state bank of uh, India opening a branch in Pakistan, and the, I think one of the Pakistani branches opening a branch in India, banks opening a branch in India and things like that. So, you know, the, the, that, that is moving forward also very slowly uh, because the business communities on both sides really want this. Um, and one of them said that Aman Kiyasha has given the governments the confidence to take concrete steps towards encouraging trade and business ties as it has given a platform to the business community. And in fact, young business leaders last year, I don't have pictures of that right now, but they, the young business leaders on both sides have had meetings also in collaboration with Aman Kiyasha. Visas I just talked about, if you go if you go to change.org slash Milnendo, we named it after, I mean, it was not meant to be named after my documentary, but people like the name, so we kept that name. Um, and that has the details of the issues that people face when applying for a visa on the other side, like police reporting, and visa is for the city and not the country, and uh, you have to exit and entry for the same point, but actually that some of these things have changed now. There is still no tourist visa between the two countries, and the uh, petition talks about, there's an update in there about the 2012 agreement between the two governments, where they agreed to lift a lot of these restrictions, and then something happened, as it always does, whenever the two governments are moving towards peace, something happens to derail the conversation, to derail the, the, the dialogue, and it ends up, you know, stalling or being moved backwards, and so the agreement that was signed has still not been implemented. So I urge everybody to go to this um, link, change.org slash Milnendo, and sign in, and that includes uh, something about, I think, um, expats also have had issues with visas. Uh, one of the campaigns we've been doing is about cross-border prisoners. Uh, we helped to release Dr. Tishti, uh, an elderly Pakistani scientist who would be un, un um, uh, falsely accused and uh, convicted, and he was actually unprecedented that the Indian Supreme Court uh, let him come back to Pakistan on bail, and then he went back for his appeal and he was actually acquitted. So this was an unprecedented case. We have issues of the prisoners of war from both countries which have still not been resolved. Um, prisoners whose jail sentences, come, they complete their jail sentences but they're not released because of bureaucratic entanglements. People who inadvertently cross the border or overstay their visas are treated like criminals, and literally, cross-border prisoners are still treated like prisoners of war. And uh, you know, we've had the case of Sarojit Singh, who was killed in prison, and then a Pakistani prisoner in India was killed as a retaliation. And so, these are things that I think are humanitarian issues. Another initiative of uh, Aman Kiyasha is the is with Rotary uh, that uh, Fayaz Sab, I don't know if you know about. The, uh, it's called Heart to Heart, and uh, under this initiative, hundreds of children from Pakistan have been successfully operated for congenital heart disease in India, and there are MOUs being worked out by doctors from India who are training doctors in Pakistan, and Rotarians in Pakistan have helped 
Indian children um, help pay for surgeries of Indian children, and the money for that is transferred right now via Chicago, I believe, because there's no it's very hard to do the cross-border uh, payment. Um, so these are the links for amankiyasha.com, which has all the, uh, you know, join us on the social media and all. I mean, I'm not saying that Amankiyasha is the solution, but it is a platform and a lot of different initiatives that are taking place, um, you know, come, come to Amal Kiyasha and say this is what we're doing and we publicize them and it sort of just ends up creating a larger constituency. This was uh, from Umid e Mulak, was, uh, which means uh, hope to meet uh, by the IIT students in Mumbai and they partnered with students in Pakistan for uh, tech fests. Uh, there's Awaz e Dosti, which is the start of friendship, which is again a you know, youth initiative on both sides of the border. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Google ad and the Coca-Cola ads that were made. And I kind of feel, but actually the Google ad, I actually sent the Google, Google people details about our Milnado campaign and all that. Two months later the Google ad came out, so I don't know if that was a coincidence. But um, I'm really glad it happened. And these, these things, and right now there's another great initiative, this Dear Neighbor, I don't know how many of you have come across that. You know, these wealthies, uh, video self portraits that people are doing um, with the hashtag dear neighbor address to the other side and that's going viral on the, on the net. So, and now people say things like, you know, that is so Amal Kiyasha, you know, which is, so you know that a movement has arrived and it's used like a, a like a adjective. That is so Amal Kiyasha. So, um, anyway, like I said, I, I wasn't here to talk about conflict, but what people are doing to overcome that conflict and to make their voices heard despite the conflict, um, so I'm very glad to be given this opportunity. Thank you so much for this and uh, to all of you for being here. So our next guest is our way from Houston. I'll just stack you up. Welcome to Texas. Still I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I just moved from Hawaii. But. <laughs> okay, um, is he here? Maybe he stepped out. Maybe Dr. Singh can. Dr. Singh? Um, I don't see Sunny Oh, no, here he is. There we go. Welcome. Welcome to Dallas, Texas. Namaste and salamu alaikum. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I want to say a very good evening to all of you. It's an honor and a pleasure to be invited to forum like this, specifically after listening to these great ladies who have made such a difference in our lives. I can talk about why we have a conflict between India and Pakistan, but I'd rather not. I can talk about the role of media, how it makes better or worse, but I'd rather not. I can talk about our politician, what's their interest, and why when a Muslim can live with Hindu, and two great countries, two great nations still do not get along, but I'd rather not. I can talk about the history, what started, how Pakistan became Pakistan, the personal interest of the Britishers who came and ruled this region. We didn't even know that there is a difference between an Indian and Pakistan. How come that we have such a great great fight brewing all the time. You know, God created us all equal. We bleed the same way. We hurt the same way. We eat the same way, and we wear, we wear our pants one leg at a time, same way. Then why? What I speak, you cannot understand. And what you speak, I don't want to understand. 
Is it really me or is it you? What can I do as a single person to make a difference? You think the new Prime Minister of India, who is so popular, has been elected recently, will listen to me? Because I'm Sunny Sharma and I live in Houston. And you think somebody in Pakistan will listen to you from Dallas, Texas? What can I do then? Well, when I started in a very short time that I had, and I'm really honored to be here, I realized that we can really talk about a lot of things. I Googled peace, and you know, there are so many different people in the past and history who talked about peace in their own way. And then, of course, in this country, we're all sports fans, and we always talk about things like football, basketball, baseball. And I also Googled some other stuff that popped up on the screen, and one of them was written by, and I'll quote this, Ajay Sahani, I don't even know who he is. And he said, there is a growing realization in South Asia that peace is vital for economic prosperity. An amicable solution to Kashmir is key to peace and development in the subcontinent. How true. Are we listening? Are we reading? Are we doing something about it? Then I looked at another one. It says South Asian Voices, October 15, 2014. The code of the week, peace, colon. A good idea that nobody wants. Why is that? And this person, Bader Iqbal Chaudhary, writes in Dawn on Pakistan Indian peace. And he said, unfortunately, peace is a good idea, but nobody wants. There are few buyers and even fewer sellers of it. The politician of the two countries appear to not want it. You know why? Because war is a good rallying point. We rally against each other. The degree of desire of the peace in the two armies is also hard to assess because the bread and the butter they receive by serving army. The media, a hostage to popular public opinion, it is a never-ending rut. How do we ever achieve peace in the region then, especially when no stakeholder wants it? And the biggest question he raised, where do we start? And I paused again and I said, wait a minute, I am really lost. What can one little me do about peace? And I thought, and I said, well, let's look at what are the major ingredients of peace? I am for peace, F-O-R-P-A-C-E. You are for peace, we are all for peace. So I took each letter and I said, what does it mean to me? F. And I said, for peace, and I said, F stands for freedom. Am I really free? Do I feel free? Do I have, am I free from poverty? Am I free from hunger? Am I free from diseases? Am I really free? Millions of people could feel that way. Then I looked at the next word letter, and it's openness, O. And I said, am I really open to others? Do I expect you to be like me? Or do I receive you the way you are and respect you and cherish you and want to work with you no matter what language you speak, what religion you belong to, and where you were born? Then I moved on and said, I want to be open to other ideas, other cultures, other people. And I said, F-O-R, R for resources. What do I have that I can offer for little me? But what others have 
that I can participate with. And I'm able to make a difference. So I need to not only find my own resources that I have, my strength, be aware of my weaknesses, but at the same time find other similar resources. Peace. P for persistence. Am I really going to believe that peace begins with me? Do I really have peace within me? How can I talk to you about peace if I don't have it with me, with my family, with my community, with my country, with my state? I belong to one community. It's more than six billion people strong. And I want to make sure that we all recognize that we're all the same. So what can I do? And I continue on to E. And I said, am I really educated to understand the differences? Hell no. I don't even know how to speak different languages. So if you're talking to me in German language, and you say, good morning, I'm going to say, what? And if I'm going to say, Shubharatri, you're going to say, what the heck is that, if you don't understand that language? But quite often we're saying the same thing. God has got so many names. If you call me Sonny back home, most of the people will say, who is Sonny? If you say Sunil, they will understand. Then I continued on and I said, I must be educated, not only learn more, but also make our other people also learn more if I can contribute in that area. Action, talk is very cheap. Am I really walking the talk or talking the walk? Am I really doing what I'm saying? Look inside yourself. And then I said to myself, okay, I can take action, but am I leader enough to inspire others to follow on the path of peace. And I went on to say, okay, I've got two more letters to go on. And I said, collaborate. As an individual, I cannot do much. Look what she's accomplished. Look what she's accomplished. And look around in this room. Even this organization who just put, who's put this show together is a collaborative effort. And then am I willing to be empowered and empower others? That is for peace. I continued on, I said to myself, wait a minute, there are a lot of people who say a lot of things. Bear Bryant, one of the probably best coaches for football in colleges, once said, and I quote, it's not the will to win that matters. Everyone has it. It's the will to prepare to win that matters. How well are you prepared to take on this challenge of peace? One of my most favorite coaches, Wins Lombardi, said, winning is not a something, it is an all-time thing. You don't win once in a while. You don't do things right once in a while. You do them right all the time. And you know what? Winning is a habit. Unfortunately, so is losing. And that's what Ms. Lamar said. I looked at some more things and I said to myself, wait a minute. Ralph Johnson Bunch, who was born in 1904 and died in 1971, once said, peace to have meaning for many who have only known suffering in both peace and war must be translated into bread or rice, shelter, health and education, as well as freedom and human dignity. Wow. Can you be peaceful if you're hurting? Can you be peaceful if your child is dying? Can you be peaceful if your neighbors are fighting? And I went on to see 
Peace cannot be achieved through violence. It can only be attained through understanding. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that. Mahatma Gandhi once said, it is possible to live in peace. Possible to live in peace. And he continued on to say, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. Are you that change? Are you willing to be that change? You know, I, I, I can go on, and, and peace may sound simple. One beautiful world, word, but it requires everything we have, every quality we have, every ounce of strength we have, every dream that we dream, every high ideal that we have, then peace is possible. Somebody once said, and I don't know who that was, he said, this is the way of peace. Overcome evil with good, and falsehood with truth, and hatred with love. Yeah. And that would be the passage to peace. Pope John Paul II said, to reach peace, teach peace. Can you not educate others who think that they're not at peace? Even Yitzhak Rabin from Israel said, peace will be victorious. And you know, as I, as I keep reading these, and I say to myself, my God, there's so much to be done. What can I do then? How can I make a difference? And I said to myself, yes, peace starts from, from me, from within. And then I said, what options do I have in this world? And there are two personal experiences I want to share with you. One I think you just mentioned, Rotary International. It's a group of people who said, this community has enriched us, given us so much, we want to give it back. One gentleman, Paul Harris in Chicago, almost 107 years ago, thought of a concept. He said, you're a lawyer, I'm a doctor, you're an engineer, and we need each other's services. So why don't we, and he was new to Chicago, and he said, why don't we get together and let's share our services so your customers can be mine and my customers can be yours. One thing I strongly believe in, that you have to be physically healthy, mentally alert, and financially capable to be able to help others. Otherwise, somebody will have to help you. So, Rotary was started 106 years ago, and they go around and work in their communities. Actually, some of the things that you posted in your program, literacy, water, clean water, food, women empowerment, creating jobs in the community, children health, polio. How many of you are aware of polio? In 1985, 350,000 people were infected with polio. It was in over 25 countries. One Rotarian said, let's do something about it. 206 countries, 102 million Rotarians said we will donate money. So this new vaccine that Paul Saban came up with, we can provide these two drops to these children. So this disease that's contagious at that level will never travel. Last year, India was one of the four countries that has been polio-free for two years. We now have three countries. Pakistan, we're down to only 246 cases of polio. Afghanistan, 
only 20 polio cases. Nigeria, only six polio cases. These Rotarians, without the help of any politician, went door to door into communities where they were told they cannot come with the help of local people. They walked in there, used their own money, their own time, to say to them that your child needs, needs these two drops. Allow us. There was some confusion and even propaganda that polio drops will make you sterile. With education, communicating with each other, Rotarians have been able to continue to march along. And millions of children are being vaccinated. And one day, one day, we're this close to eradicating polio from the face of the earth. People like Paul and Melinda Gates Foundation partnered with us, and he has given more than $350 million to Rotary International to put together the concept that yes, if we unite together, we can eradicate this deadly disease from the face of the earth. You know, Rotary also started one of the biggest challenge for Rotary is peace and world understanding. So they started peace centers. There are nine peace centers throughout the world. North Carolina, West Yorkshire, England, Buenos Aires, Argentina, Paris, France, Tokyo, Japan, California, USA, Brisbane, Australia, Ubasa, Sweden, and Bangkok, Thailand. Rotarians select people like you and I and pay for them to go attend two-year programs at these universities. At this current moment, 400 scholars are studying these programs to learn how to resolve a conflict, how to bring peace. And just for this program, I kind of flipped through and I said, oh my God, there are great people in there. And I'm going to quote a couple of those as to what they're saying. And they're in Africa, Asia. There's a lady, Amanda Martin, said, the Rotary Peace Fellowship introduces me to peace and justice issues. And an amazing cast of characters working on positive peace in Southeast Asia. My career path of working for human rights in Latin America has now taken an international turn. I have relocated to Thailand to work for Burmese Human Right. By the way, my dad did his medical college from Burma, and he walked during the Second World War to come to India. This is a direct result of my experience in the Rotary program at the university that gave me this privilege. And I can probably spend all night long reading this testimonial for you, but I won't. So Rotary is one vehicle that can take care of the first comment that we talked about, peace as it relates to health, hunger, food, jobs, shelter, education, and supporting each other. There's another organization that was actually started by Dwight Eisenhower. And he said, I like to believe that people in the long run are going to do more to promote peace than our governments. This is President of the United States of America talking. Indeed, I think that people want peace so much that one of these days governments had better get out of the way and let them have it. 1989. Germany. Berlin Wall, four people who started this campaign that our families are across this wall that was built and we cannot see each other. This wall must come down in a church. 1989, October the 9th, 
a group of four people turned into 70,000 strong people who walk what they call the Ring Road. Secretary James Baker fought. Ronald Reagan fought. Nothing happened. Ronald Reagan even said to Gorbachev, Gorbachev, bring the wall down. But the force of united group of 70,000 people, quietly, peacefully walking, with the military standing right around them, they could have shot, they could have killed them. Stashis were watching them. They gave in. A month later, the war came down. I was proud to be there just last month. And this time, there were 200,000 people walking the same ring road, holding hands, parents crying, telling the children what it used to be. And you think six billion people cannot bring the peace in the world? When in Berlin, only 70,000 people? 1.2 billion people in India? And almost 600 million people in, in Pakistan? We cannot bring peace together? Peace can be achieved. You have to really believe in it. You have to really make it happen for you. I feel that what we have heard tonight is so powerful. I'm humbled and honored to be sharing just my vision, just my thoughts with you. And I hope and pray that when you leave this room tonight, you leave with your heart. You manage with your head. And you give with your hands. Because it is in serving that we receive the most. And if we serve our fellow human being, just one person at a time, we can make that difference. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Bible, Book of Matthews, verse 9. We, you, are all children of God. My son attended a peace conference that was put together just last year in, in Israel. In a little town, called uh, Nev Shalom. This is the community that Arabs and the, the people from Israel, Jewish, put together and they decided to live together. There is a waiting list of 300 families to be in their, in their participation. I want to close by saying that we are all children of God. Let us do our duty and sow the seeds of love and make peace possible through service. May peace be with you. Interesting uh, uh, points of view this evening uh, from a uh, scholarly point of view, uh, a job's point of view, and sort of very touching emotional <laughs> point of view on a personal level. Uh, I'm Dr. Kripal Singh, and uh, I want to thank 
um, UTD Asia Center for inviting us, and also South Asia Center us, Professor Watch, for having this event, and a board member of that organization as well. So, um, how do you really, I know it's gotten late, so I'll, I'll, I won't take more than 10 minutes. How do you really measure the cost of conflict in South Asia? Um, I'm not too sure about that. Uh, how can you, how can you measure the physical pain that somebody went through? How can you measure the emotional devastation of not just an individual of a geographical area or a community of millions of people? I don't know. We can try to put some metrics uh, uh, on different realms, whether it's economics, whether it's casualties of war, whether it's atrocities, rapes, you name it. Military spending. In some aspects, we can do that. But in others, I'm not too sure how we can do that. But in the next 10 minutes or so, here's what I'm going to share with you. Some background to the conflict. And I was asked to include six as well, so because I'm practicing six, I'll say the significance of the six, and some economics and the opportunities. So I'll try not to replicate what's already been said here. So, you know, you guys know, most of you are from that part of the world, what happened. So, when, when you have a, two states being made up, created, okay, uh, based on religion, Hindustan for Hindus and Pakistan for Muslims, uh, lines are being drawn, and there's a lot of politicking going on, right? Um, the, the sixth point of view of Kali, though, was the main political party, they were for United Punjab. And obviously, when everybody wants their pie, you, and you want everything to be in harmony, you get nothing. So sixth point of view was, we want United Punjab, United South Asia. So sixth um, ended moving to the Indian side. So when you, when you think about the, uh, the division of the um, creation of those two states, um, a million people died when that happened in 1947. I'm not sure if, if we can even fathom to imagine that. A million people died when, when the, these two nations were created. And there's a lot of research, and British documents have been leaked recently, some of them, not all of them, which, which, which say, which easily point out what could have happened to prevent this, but obviously it did not. And it's not just British. People on the both sides do not take that entire. The largest forced migration in human history happened in 1947. Six million people were displaced from their homes. You have to really, you know, India has a population of 1.2 billion. Back in 1947, it was like 350 million. I mean, imagine these numbers. If you're a statistician, mathematics guy, or you have to love this stuff, and you're like, this is incredible. But how do you measure the pain and suffering? A million people died. Majority of the six lived more than 50% on the west side but moved to the Indian side. And obviously we heard about the Kashmir issue. Um, still unresolved. And this is actually my cue to recognize my grandmother who's sitting back there, um, who was born in Lahore, who <laughs> was born in Lahore, which is part of this is West Punjab part of Pakistan. Suffered through the part partition. Witnessed three wars between India and Pakistan. And yes, there's a war on here. Uh, undeclared war. It's kind of ongoing. <laughs> it's ongoing. Witnessing that and the genocidal campaigns of 1984. So to, this is not just a story of my grandma, because she's living. This is a story of millions of people regardless of their faith, 
regardless of whether they were in Punjab at the time, or Delhi at the time, or what is become Pakistan at the time, regardless of that. But what keeps me going, and others who are here like yourself going, is that spirit for justice, the spirit for human dignity, the spirit to be just free like a butterfly. That's the human spirit. And to me, my grandmother represents that because my grandfather was actually born and not in India, in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. My grandmother was born in, in what's, what's not Pakistan. So I've spent the majority of my life, I was not born in India, I was born in, sorry, I was not born in Punjab, I was born in, South, in India and in South in Delhi. So people ask me, and I've lived the majority of my life in, in, in the U.S. as a kid when I immigrated. So people ask me, who are you? Well, I lived most of my life here, um, and then yes, Sikhs are not recognized as a term of community. The country says we're Hindu, so I'm not really that. Uh, I, I um, you know, it is my birthplace, and I'm proud of it. Um, but I don't look like I, when people think of turbans, you know, they think of you know terrorists. Taliban. So it's like you know, when I immigrated here in the 80s, the Iran Contra was going on. I was uh, uh, Iranian, I was called. And the Gulf War happened, I became that. And Taliban came, and I became that. So my son, who's in second grade, he asked, Dad, what are we? I said, I don't know, man. I'm confused myself. <laughs> Point is, this is the background. You and I know it. <laughs> Why is significance to the six? Because Punjab is usually the battleground because of historical reasons, because it is the, when, when, when the partition happened, literally, you know, states went this side or that side, but Punjab was divided. Bengal was divided as well, but Punjab was not as civilized, it was brutal. Mm -hmm. And Kashmir till this day, you see the brutality. So Punjab, there's historical reasons for the link to geography reasons. It is very, very pivotal, and six regiments from the Indian side are always at the front. So six are always affected because of this. And immediately what happens is, because most of the six shrines, if not half, I would say most, are on the West Punjab in Pakistan, the, the, the visa restrictions occur for Sikh pilgrims. You know, my wife's grandfather came from what's outside Lalpur. So now I took my wife after there to get married. The people in that village, we found the house, they treated me like I'm their parona. You know what I'm talking about, I'm their dama. It it's, it's the beauty of the emotions that were there. But the point is, this is what happens, right? Retaliation. So it, it's, it, it matters to the six. And then the last point I'll make is the drug mafia. Mm. According to Punjab Agriculture University in Ljubljana, 70% of Boys between the ages of 14 and 26 are on drugs in Punjab. These are government, it's a government institution. 70, 70. 70%. 40% are girls are on drugs. We're not talking alcohol, we're talking hardcore stuff. My feeling is it's much higher. These are government numbers. If the numbers are lower, close to Kashmir. Not even close in Rajasthan or Gujarat. These are the areas that border Pakistan. And they have a much bigger border than Punjab does. So this is by design. There are people on both sides who want to have it, make this happen. So the point is, it is relevant to the Sikhs, even though it's not just affecting the Sikhs, it's affecting uh, the Hindus who lived in Punjab as well. But it's crucial to the Sikhs because the majority of Sikh population lives in Punjab. So let me turn the pages a little bit. Economics. This day and age, I'm sorry to say this, things are driven by economics. It is simply economics. You can have the, you can have the emotion, you can devise a brilliant plan, bring parties together, but unless the economics, the number, the, the math adds up, the two plus two have to add up. Otherwise, things won't get. So you, this is where the politicking comes in, and this is where you and I, who are in the business world, who have connection in policy making, we ought to do. You got to trade with your neighbor, man. 
USA and Canada are the biggest trading partners, $597 billion. China is second, for obvious reasons. Even US and Mexico, $481 billion. These are 2012 numbers. So people often say that, you know what, India and Pakistan, they don't get along, you know. China and Japan don't get along. They are trading $375 billion a year. China and South Korea don't get along. South Korea, not North. $198 billion. China and Taiwan. They are trading, but India and Pakistan are not. These don't get along. They have to come together. Yeah. Exactly. The point is, they're still trading. Yeah. So we got to bring the math into this. South Asian Cold War. This is according to the Economist. I'll ask you to read it. You can read it, please. According to Economist, South Asia is about the least integrated part of the world. Neighbor supply is 25% of India's import and consume less than 4% of its exports. India and Pakistan mutually and the top. Plastic account for a fifth of all living humans, yet their bilateral trade is puny, at least less than three billion a year. This is an economic as well as a diplomatic problem. Lack of integration helps to keep South Asians poor. By one estimate, without barriers, trade between India and Pakistan would grow nearly ten. This is the economist. Yeah. Look at this. They trade 0.5%, 4%, 3 billion? 3 billion? Look at these numbers. These guys don't get along. The business leaders, the strategic, the think tank from both sides need to get on board. Cannot afford to keep South Asians, no matter what part of they are from, poor. If you do that, you are really doing a disservice to your own country. And so, what needs to happen? There's got to be change in attitude. We, we, we cannot afford to have a policy of have any thought processes that are derogatory to me. Can't afford to not realize this. Pakistan and India, very, they're in infancy, if you look at the overall history of the world. 70 years, approximately. England and France, they were sworn enemies of each other. They fought a hundred year war, just to let you know, back in the Middle Ages. So it's going to take time, it's going to take generations, but you cannot wait till it some foreign body will do it for you. People in this room have to play a role. What do we have to do? We have to create awareness and focus on the benefits of partnership. I already made the business case for it. You gotta work on something else besides the attitude and the, the math. Here's the third thing. This is, if I can tell you one thing from my talk, it's not point number three. Raise voice and silent extremist point of view. If you don't raise your voice, the squeaky wheel is going to get the grease. You've got to raise the voice. It takes guts. It takes courage. Not afterwards. Not afterwards, I told you so. Right there and then. You know, people talk about Shaheed and all this terminology. The word that means Shaheed is actually the one who witnesses. The truth. So you got to be that. You have to raise the voice to decide on that extremist point of view. And when you do that, it's not going to be easy. I have some experience with it a little bit. Get ready for name caller. You will be called a sellout. Some even might even call you <laughs> extremist yourself. Uh, but develop a thick skin. Because if you do not stand up, you know, the, the, the cost is already there. Yeah. And for Kashmir, we talked about 
actually, you know, there's forceful conversions going on 300, 400 years ago. And there was a Kashmiri Brahmin who came and actually talked to the ninth guru of the six, Guru Dev Bhagavad. And it was him who laid down his life. Yeah. He laid down his life back in the 17th century to bring peace. So peace does not come easy. Peace has a big price. Ask the South Rabin, former prime minister. Peace has big price, but you and I need to play that. You and I need to be the agents of that. Because if you don't have that dialogue, the status quo will remain, and establishment, they will, they, they will carry on with the status quo. Last, hold leaders accountable. We are, Mr. Sharma touched on this, we are not in Pakistan or India any part of Asia. We are here. So what do we mean by hold leaders accountable? You know a lot of leaders come here. Religious leaders, political leaders, a lot of people come here. You have to hold them accountable. What I mean by that is, if you are in charge of a cultural organization, if you are in the leadership position of a religious organization, of educational organization, even non-profit organization, you got to give platform, you got to give time to the people who are agents of peace, not merely talkers. you got to give time to those people and energy and money. People come here to fundraise all the time. But if you are part of a business association, this is where conscious comes in, this is where you have to step it up and hold leaders accountable. I would just like to end with a personal funny story. You know, politicians, when I took AP government in 12th grade, believe me, there was an oral exam back there. I took it, I remember one question. The question was, what is the first, what is the first job of a politician after he or she gets elected? <laughs> I being the uh, student student I was, I said, well, it is to thank the uh, people who have helped him or her get elected, constituency, you know, that sort of stuff. Dead wrong. Zero. Prepare for the next one. You're getting warmer. The, the, the first, absolutely first job of politician, U.S. AP government senior in high school was to make sure you get reelected. <laughs> so, if you and I, we cannot hold out for our hope that a politician is going to do that. A politician is going to do it when it's right for them, it's sort of purpose. And we need to have those political connections to utilize those opportunities that are rare. But you must stand up and do it. And those of you who are wondering how you can be part of South Asian Democracy Watch, you can be doing it. We're looking to diversify our panel not just from one part of South Asia. Yeah. Thank you for the time, and I turn it over to you. Thank you so much for open the floor for question and answer. And so, we had Attorney to, um, to see Kamal here with us. He wanted to present on the legal framework and an impact, but we're not going to do that because we don't have any time. But during the question and answer, I want everybody, there's going to be reception afterwards, and I do want everybody to um, Reach and reach out to him. He has great knowledge on sort of the Indo Pak and again legal framework. There's a question here. Can you please stand up and identify yourselves. Yes, uh, my name is Sayyid Qureshi. I'm the founder <coughs> editor of Diplomatic Times, and currently I have, uh, I'm editing Upright Opinion, which you might have read several yes, articles. Yes, there. yes. You know, sir, what do you read that? G sometimes. Yes. Okay, very good. <coughs> First of all, uh, well, this is a very important seminar, very crucial one, and uh, I really compliment from my core part the organizers and uh, sponsors of this very uh, momentous uh, uh, discussion debate. And uh, I think this was very much needed in the present set of circumstances in India and Pakistan as well as around the world. So, uh, in fact, uh, the basic problem with India and Pakistan, as you know, 
in the problem of Kashmir. I read also one, the problem of uh, Sikhs also, because they also need a separate territory, which is hanging fire for them almost 67 years now. Because this was promised to them during the partition plan, that they would get it, but they were denied. So it's not only one problem, Kashmir, it's also the problem of Sikhistan also. You may call it, give it any name. So uh, I think uh, this uh, problem of Kashmir, let's focus on that problem first of all. Because that was the main discussion uh, point in this very valuable seminar. So uh, Kashmir, in fact, is a simple spillover problem. It's a chronic problem from the partition of 1947. It has been never resolved. It will never be resolved, I tell you, for all time to come. No matter how valuable, <coughs> how important uh, suggestions you make in this seminar or elsewhere, because they have been being made, you know, for all these decades, but there is no outcome. So the reason? That's a good question, so, sort of, if I can transition the discussion. Is there a solution? I mean, it's been going on since 1947. Do we, is it reasonable to think that there will be a solution given what's going on on, on the ground? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, just want to, I just want to say that, oh, sorry, it's not on. Uh, well, I think, I don't think I that we can. One more time. Well, if you finish your question, then we can. Yeah, you should go ahead. Go ahead and finish your question. So let me finish first. Yeah. So the, the speakers in this August uh, seminar, even today, have presented, uh, in fact, utopian solutions and fanciful solutions which have been never worked out, you know, and which were never uh, productive in all these 67 years. You may not have any lavish things. What's your question? Yeah. You, uh, <laughs> my question is that if, let's say, my question is that uh, uh, if Germany can get together, why? Because they were one nation. They spoke the same language and they separated. So, uh, I want you to have a but long discussion. Say this time for a minute. Can you allow for one minute now? Yeah. Can you allow well, for one minute? Yeah. So, one minute only. My solution, <laughs> according to my. According to my. She has, my to, she has to leave in five minutes. So. Confederation between yeah. and Pakistan. I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I know confederation. This is emotional, emotional. Picture. Is that what you're proposing? Confederation of Confederation between India and Pakistan. Thank you. I apologize for that. I know it's emotional, but we do have other questions. No, I think, I think that's an excellent solution. In fact, that is the solution that was proposed by Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah in 1964 when he went to Pakistan to negotiate with uh, General Ayub Khan at the time and to, hold, uh, to talk about political accommodation. And I think the Musharraf four-point plan was a move in the right direction. It would have at least laid the framework mm -hmm. to establish a conducive environment in which the people of Jammu and Kashmir would have eventually felt free <coughs> to express their political aspirations. But unfortunately, the four-point plan wasn't pursued either by India or by Pakistan. It fell through the cracks. And there was a lot of opposition to it by groups on both sides of the line of control because, as you pointed out, there are military officials, politicians, civil society actors, as well as militants, non-state actors, on both sides of the line of control who have been beneficiaries of the conflict mm -hmm. and who would like to keep it simmering. Yep, yep. So I think the idea of a confederation uh, is is uh, laudable and one that should be pursued. Absolutely. Would you like to? I just just want to add to that that I don't think that we can say that it will never be resolved because, like you pointed <coughs> out, there have been uh, viable solutions that have been proposed. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons that uh, it didn't the Musharraf four point formula did not get taken forward is because he was not an elected yeah. leader. And you know, you that's just. The, the, I think the point, the point you made about the electoral process, the democratic process, I think is really, really critical to this whole issue here. And I think I just want to reiterate the uh, what I when I start when I started working with India-Pakistan peace issues, 
uh, with the Pakistan India People's Forum for Peace and Democracy, which is the largest people to people uh, lobby on both sides. You know, uh, one of the things that was said at the very first conflict, and I'm not, I don't know the exact words, but I just kind of roughly quoted <coughs> that uh, Kashmir should not be treated as a piece of real estate between India and Pakistan, but as a matter of the lives and aspirations of the Kashmiri people, whose views should be taken into account whenever any solution is being proposed. And that's not what both countries have been doing, although I think they have started mm -hmm. to do that. They have started to take the Kashmiris into uh, consideration. So I think that to say that it's never going to be resolved, I think that is not uh, right. I think it will be one day. But I, and I, I would just, uh, you know, I would, what, what everybody on the panel has said, that everybody has to raise a voice and, you know, take this forward and not let it just sit there. And hold our policy makers accountable. Yeah, yeah. And our next question. Is there time for another question? Yeah, there is time for another question. Oh. It's brief and concise. Okay. <laughs> so when you were uh, on your way to UT Dallas, you must have noticed that it had, the university has a huge Indo Pak community students. And as a Pakistani, all of my, most of my friends have been Indians. I, have, uh, I do everything together with them, eat, joke, you know, confide them, share sorrows and happiness. And I've even lived with Indians in the same flat. So clearly, there's a lot of love and we can live together. But when it comes to the showdown, that is, when it comes to actively mobilizing for uh, this cause of indo pak peace, uh, there is some apathy. They, they are not as interested as many others are. Uh, why do you think that is? I, I can say because uh, it, our, this is just my gut feeling, okay? I, don't, I think there's a lack, a sincere lack of interest because they know uh, the, where they're coming from in both the countries, both the political and religious leaders are failure. And you look for traditionally these two people, individuals, who are supposed to guide you and who are supposed to take care of you. And when both of those leaders fail you and use the resources that are available to you to fulfill their own interest and give an extremist point of view, I think it's a big turn off and I think that's what happens. I think, can I add to that? I think we as a people, and I'm talking about Indians as well as Pakistanis, haven't seriously thought about the process of nation building haven't seriously thought about the process of societal reconstruction. And we have been led to believe that the identity of a state, the identity of a society can be built on unquenchable hate. That we need to oppose the other. The other for Indians is Pakistan and for Pakistanis is India. That, that, is, that our identity is built on unquenchable hatred for the other. And unfortunately, my generation, that is, <clears throat> we've inherited that legacy from politicians, policy makers, decision makers, as well as non-state actors who came before us. But it is time to question that legacy. It is time to deconstruct it. And to realize that the welfare of the populace is a lot more important. That providing access to the populace of India, as well as to the populace of Pakistan, to healthcare, to education, to basic social services is a lot more important than, than hostility between the two nations that we have nurtured over the, over the years, over these decades. I am going to have to uh, cut the session now and cut the question and answer. The panelists will be around um, so um, to actually answer any questions that you may have. At this point, I would like to bring, ask a seat if you can please come um, to uh, give our closing remarks. I made a, a horrible error. It started with it was a beautiful poem to open a session, so um, um, I apologize for that. Yeah. So I'll take a couple with my hands. Okay. He might have taken one of the whole time. Okay. Um, prior to seeing co um, um, closing, I did want to say that um, the Asia Center, in partnership with Genocide and South Asian Democracy, where I will continue the um, conversation um, that we brought up the important point of how do we involve women in our economic system, yeah. what happens with countries that don't. 
We will open it, um, our RTSN will come here to our community on April 24th. We'll open the discussion with gender side, and what's the global gender side, and then transition to women empowerment. And um, so you're all invited to, to um, return on April 24th. I've given you the save the date. Um, also, in your program, there's the Beyond Right and Wrong. Um, Lena Singh is a, a local Indian producer, a brilliant woman, and brilliant producer. And um, she's created a, a, a short film. It does, um, you're watching the film, donates to several organizations. You select it, whether it's um, a women's institution, a, a women's organization, Connect Teach. Please go ahead and watch that. And, and every watch is a donation to uh, organization of your choosing. So that part is in there. Okay? And please, you can close for us, please. Okay. Thank you so much. No. Thank you so much, Monica. Much appreciated uh, your support <coughs> and your help in uh, having this uh, tremendous uh, conference and seminar. Uh, we want to thank, uh, on behalf of South Asian Democracy Watch, to you, uh, UT uh, Asia Center, and thank you for your leadership in that. Uh, I'd like to request all the board members of South Asian Democracy Watch to please uh, come to the front. And uh, number one, we recognize, and number two, also collectively, if we can uh, thank all of our uh, panelists and our guests. So if you will please uh, come to the front, I'll appreciate that. While we are waiting, can I say thanks to Mr. Wah? I think the life is unique to this. Amr Tiyasha, I just learned from you that that's not something that we use on this program. That's not something what? Yes, Amr Tiyasha. From your remarks, I learned that this logo and everything is. No, I, I have. I didn't start it. I just well, whoever started it, but there's no credit for this program. Yeah. There's no credit. Anyway, I can just say another question. He has no credit. He has no credit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, but at the same time, uh, I would like to ask our president, Mr. Amir Makani, to please, uh, uh, to please uh, give a gift of our gratitude to all, to all of our panelists. First of all, uh, since uh, uh, Ms. Dr. Naila Khan has to leave, I would like to ask her to please come and, uh, and accept a gift of our gratitude from us. I tried to friend you, but I couldn't go to Thank you so much. If you'd like to write up your remarks and like Second, I would like to uh, request uh, that Mina, sir. Vina Server, please uh, come and uh, be recognized and accept our gift. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sunny Sharma to please come and be recognized and accept our gift. Thank you very much. Dr. Sir Paul Singer, if you will please, although you are part of the group, please accept our gratitude and thank you very much. And, and last but not least, I would like to invite Monique to please come and be recognized 
thank you so much for your support and thank you very much for being there for us. So, I would like to Last but not least, there is uh, uh, we have made uh, arrangements for some uh, some snacks, some light food, some pizza. Uh, it's outside in the atrium. If you will please help yourself. And at the same time, as Dr. Prapal Singh mentioned, we want to diversify our group. We want more representation, not only from different countries, but also from different.